Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is Andrew Cummins. I'm joined by my colleague, Moe Dun. We are going to do a quick overview of some exciting new features in Amicus Attorney 20.4. So uh, it's uh, really appreciate you guys taking some time out to uh, uh, take out of your busy day to learn more about the product. Just a couple of quick uh, housekeeping things. If you wanted to ask any questions, please use the questions pane on the right-hand side of your screen. We'll certainly have time at the end of the session to address uh, any questions that you've got. And uh, uh, certainly, if there's anything we need to take offline, we can easily do so afterwards as well. So we've just got a couple of quick uh, slides just to uh, demonstrate what we're going to talk about today. Basically, again, we're just really excited to release uh, 20.4. We'll give you an overview, and we'll jump in and actually play around with the application and, and demonstrate the features to you. And as I said, we'll have a time for question and answers uh, at the end as well. Okay, so uh, we're going to start off. We've got three really big features that make up the uh, 20.4, as well as a, a bunch of other uh, great ones as well. So we're just going to start with a quick overview. We've got a new single sign-on capability, APX Pay Now, and Enhanced File Custom Page Layouts. And uh, Mo and I are actually going to tag team here, and we'll be able to talk through and then demonstrate these uh, capabilities. But uh, the single sign-on is, is really a great tool to make sure that your firm uh, or your Amicus attorney can, uh, can adhere to the any password requirements that your firm may have in that you can now actually map your Amicus attorney users to Active Directory and it means that when you launch your Amicus, you won't actually have to put in your password because it will recognize that you're already logged into your domain. Uh, so it really simplifies the process of getting into Amicus, uh, but it also actually ensures that your uh, Amicus uh, anywhere and mobile app users are all using the same password, and that is your domain password. So we'll jump in in a moment to take a look. Okay, and uh, this is Mo Eden. Um, thanks again for joining us. Um, the next uh, big feature there is uh, APX PNL. As you uh, can recall, APX is Abacus Payment Exchange, and uh, we had the previous releases. We had uh, allow a firm to, uh, you know, collect their credit card store it in the system securely uh, in our APX uh, uh, site, and we uh, we allow you to process uh, payment from that by doing receive payment or trust receipt, etc. Now we are taking it a step further. We are allowing you uh, to uh, send to your client a copy of your uh, invoice along with uh, an embedded URL, so you can uh, request from your client. Uh, to make prompt payment, as you all know that um, quite often you get a bill, you might put it down and then you know decide to pay it later on. In this way, uh, it's right in the client phase. They can just click on a, um, a URL, and that will allow them to, to make the payment immediately, so you get uh, payment uh, uh, more promptly. Um, so I'll go through the demo when we, when we go through the demo and show you there are two ways that uh, you can do it. You can do it at the billing stage when you're creating your bill, or you can do it after the fact, after you create your bill. And um, once uh, the client makes the payment, uh, the, the software is updated, and we'll show you that. Perfect. So yeah, and then the final of the big three is uh, now changes to the file custom page layouts. And uh, essentially what we're allowing you to do is really create a per file type dashboard. So for instance, all your real estate files can have a nice new dashboard, and that's because your file custom pages can now include list views, so like your list of notes, your list of time entries, uh, as well as other core fields. So actually some really cool changes that we want to, uh, to jump in and, and show you. So with that, let's actually uh, get into uh, the demo component here. And uh, what I'm actually going to do is quickly show the uh, actually a little movie here that actually demonstrates the what single sign-on is all about. So in this case, if you actually now launch into Amix Attorney by double-clicking onto the icon, it actually recognizes that you're logged into your domain and then automatically signs you into Amix Attorney. So you don't actually need any separate password for Amix Attorney. And that's a great option because if, uh, if your firm already has multi-factor authentication in order to get into your workstation, then you don't need to jump through more hoops to put in a password for Amicus Attorney. And then what you can also see here is in terms of making that uh, change, we've actually gone and added a new option under firm settings. So this is something your administrator would go and do, and they go up to login management and actually choose to enable the single sign-on capabilities. So what this does is maps the Amicus Attorney users 
specifically to Active Directory uh, users in your firm. So uh, in this case, we've got already two users that are mapped. If you actually just select the user on the Amicus firm member, their corresponding uh, Active Directory user and click the map, then you can actually uh, make that association very easily. Of course, you can also use the auto option and it will automatically map those users for you very quickly too. Uh, and then once you've actually enabled the uh, single sign-on capabilities under user management, again, this is a capability limited to your administrator, you would see a column for the Active Directory user. And you can also from there go and change Active Directory mapping if you needed to uh, choose a different user. And then the other thing, because passwords are no longer set within Amicus Attorney, they're instead actually managed through Active Directory the uh, password screen actually just reflects that so that users can see that on their screen from within Amicus. But this is a great tool to, uh, if you've already got obviously very secure access to your desktop, then you can simplify the process of logging into Amicus. The other key thing to appreciate is, is it also means that your password for your mobile app and for Amicus Anywhere if you're using those is then using your domain password. So that of course, if that automatically changes or needs to change as per your firm uh, requirements every 30 days or every 60 days or what have you, it does make sure that that password is updated and is then in use for, uh, for every way you access your Amicus attorney. So a really huge improvement uh, that can benefit a lot of users, in particular uh, people using uh, Abacus Private Cloud as well. So uh, a great solution for uh, improving it. And with that, we'll turn it over to, to Mo here. So what I'm going to do now is uh, go through the APX uh, part of it, the uh, embedded URL. Um, first thing you want to do is uh, set up your system. Um, to be, you want to go into the email option for, uh, on the billing side here and uh, indicate where you want your bill to go. So you, it's preferable that the bills, when before you send it out to your client, you get a chance to review the bill. So I normally set it uh, to the draft folder. And you'll notice um, we add uh, an additional tab there for APX URL. And what that does is allow you to um, customize um, the body of your email. Uh, you may want to add uh, additional information in there. Um, if you're using the template, you can also include it embedded in your template uh, any sort of uh, a logo, uh, additional information that is not allowed in the standard uh, body. So the first thing you might want to do is go in here and make sure it's uh, set up to, to the way you, you want it. You'll notice in here there's a, a click this link to pay on, online. And when I create the email, you'll notice that that will be an embedded URL that the client will then click, will be able to click on that. So let me just get out of here, and um, there are two ways that you can um, send those emails. As I mentioned, one is by creating a bill, and at the time you create the bill, you can tell the system to include that uh, URL and uh, send the email. So I'll do that later on. For now, I'll go through uh, the first part here. Uh, let's say you have some existing bills, and uh, you know it's age over time. On my system, I have it aged for over 30 days here. And you might want to go uh, um, go ahead and send an email to remind the client uh, that the bill is overdue and give them that uh, opportunity to make the payment promptly. So the first thing you, you'll notice is on your left-hand side here, we have filter. And we use the same billing module that, uh, that, that was there before. And you can filter using these various options here uh, to indicate what period you want, or you can get a full listing and then determine from there uh, which invoice you want to send uh, the email uh, on. So um, let me just click on, on these here. I can click on all of them by just clicking on the top button there, uh, or I can selectively go and click on individual one. Now I'll just uh, I'll just do one for now. Uh, the first one there, and I'll uh, click, if you notice, when I click on that checkbox there, there is a an APX uh, button there uh, for sending that uh, um, email. So if we click on that, we're adding basically uh, what we call a payment request to that invoice, and the payment request means that we're, we're creating an email uh, to send to our client. So I'll just click on OK. 
tell me because I indicated in my firm setting to put that bill in draft, it indicates here where the, that uh, bill is. And you'll notice that it'll refresh the screen and we have an indication that this uh, invoice have a payment request now. So you can see the, the icon, the little icon is on there. And if I go to my inbox, or sorry, my draft uh, folder there, you'll notice it create that uh, email there. I'll just open it to show you what it looked like. So we have an invoice attached there. That's the invoice uh, that uh, was previously created. And these are the wording that you, you can uh, modify. We have the amount of the invoice listed there along with uh, you know, the signature line. But the main thing here is this URL is already embedded in there. So I'm just going to send that invoice now. I'm sending it to Andrew here, and he'll pull it up on his phone in a moment. So let me just click on send there. And uh, that invoice, uh, that email is sent to Andrew. And uh, is it on this? Uh, or is it on yeah, the name? Minimize that. OK. So I'll let uh, Andrew take over here. He is uh, my client, so he's hopefully going to pay this bill. Okay. So we're just, uh, we're just going to refresh, and that should come true in a moment. No. Take a little while longer. Uh, should come through any second now. Yeah. Let's just make sure it went uh, not stuck in your outbox. Yeah. Okay. It was sent. Can you do a refresh there? Yeah. It's not uh, not coming up there, but that's okay. We can still demonstrate it from here as though we are actually acting as a client again. Okay. So once Sandy... Oh, no, it just came through. Oh, it just came through? Okay. Take a little while to come through there, but it finally did. Okay. So we're viewing Andy uh, phone here now, and because your inbox is full. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So here we have the um, the email that was sent to Andrew, and uh, attached at the bottom there you can see the invoice. But if you, Andrew click on the URL, uh, it will bring up. Um, so let's click on the URL there. It will bring up the interface for you to make the payment. Right, so Andy is uh, filling out his information there. It uh, capture uh, the billing address uh, from um, Amicus and fill that in for us. However, um, Andy has to fill out the credit card information. We don't want to send that over because uh, you know how secure that should be. And uh, just uh, enter you. Make some changes there, that's good. Okay, uh, before you, okay, that's fine. I was just going to show the view the bill here. Uh, at the top, you have an option there to view the bill and it have the amount of, of the bill that we, uh, we're gonna pay. Now, if you notice, uh, Andy didn't have to fill out any amount there. We don't want them to make the mistake or make a partial payment. Uh, when we send a request for a payment, we're requesting payment of the full amount, right? Now, here we have uh, a response from APX indicating that the payment was successfully processed, and we have an option for the user to click on uh, view receipt, and you'll be able to view the, um, the receipt of the payment. Uh, notice at the top here, too, we can take a printout of that payment, uh, of that receipt, sorry. Um, and once um, you're finished, you'll notice that Andy can just switch over to his inbox there, and he should receive a receipt um, in a moment. It's a little slow on our system here. But uh, in a moment, he should um, receive a receipt. Uh, but I can just switch over now. While you're doing that, I can switch back over to... Um, oh, it just, oh it just came up? Okay. So the receipt is listed here, $106 that was paid by Andy. And it indicates here... Um, all of the credit card information, uh, it was paid today's date, and it indicates um, the transaction ID, etc. Okay. 
So let's switch over now to um, back to Amicus here. And I'll just minimize that. Okay. So if we, um, if we look at the paid uh, item here now, we'll notice that that 160 was paid here, right? You can see, I'm not sure. So the 160 was paid here. The amount is zero and it remove uh, that icon from the invoice number. So right now, the payment is an APX payment, as if the client has walked into the office and made that payment. Uh, but notice how convenient is it the client uh, initiate the payment directly from the email and make that payment, and that payment is updated almost immediately within Amicus. And at this stage here, that payment is basically uh, an APX payment. So you can do uh, your void if you have to do it or refund. Uh, you treat it exactly as an APX payment. Okay. So uh, that's how you will initiate a, a payment request directly from the billing module. But as I mentioned, um, within the, the billing process, you can also go and uh, initiate a, a payment request. So I placed a bill in, um, in, in final here uh, so that uh, we can speed up the process here. So I'll do a print and post here, and I'll just put it on the screen here, and we have the bill here, right? And that will also create an email, but I wouldn't go through that process because you you see the basically the same thing there. Awesome, okay. fantastic, Mo. Yeah, I think uh, if you haven't already signed up for APX, that's a great reason to uh, to do so now because this really speeds up the collections because the clients can just click the link in their um, uh, in their email. Okay, so the other uh, section we wanted to talk about was changes to file custom pages. And so let's just quickly jump into, I've got a matter here, the Cooperman D. Cooperman, and I want to show you what our current uh, custom pages look like, and then uh, and then see some changes that we've actually made. So as you most likely know, you can go and create custom pages on a per file type basis with an MEX attorney. So we happen to be looking at a family law file, and that might have one set of custom pages whereas a real estate closing or litigation would uh, perhaps want to track very different information. So the product itself allows you to create custom pages. So we created one called court information and, and put in a variety of fields. Uh, so this is what we could do within uh, previous versions. What we've now, however, added is the ability to go and put more than just custom fields on any of your custom pages. And what that means is basically we can take any of the current lists that you show, like your events or uh, phone calls or uh, time entries, and actually put that into uh, what we call a list view on a custom page. So what I've done here is created a custom page. This is called a family dashboard, and it actually is showing, you can see a list actually embedded within that custom page, and that's showing all of my active to-dos. And uh, but what you'll also notice here is some of these fields are not custom fields. They're actually what we would call core fields, which right now, if you wanted to look for the responsible lawyer, you might have to actually go into admin, for instance, and go on to accounting or on the general tab and see that, or, or some of the other fields may actually be a bit buried, where if they're ones that you need to have access to all the time or just with one click, you can go put that onto your custom page so that you can make changes or view all those details uh, in, a, in a glance. What, what's also great is that, so this happens to be a half page custom page, but you can also create a full page. So this happens to be one where you've gone and chosen to include three different list views. So the idea is people have uh, much larger lap or much larger screens than in the past, and therefore you now have the opportunity to take up or take advantage of all of that real estate uh, that you can go and put in a whole bunch of, uh, of different list views, for instance. Of course, if you maximize that, you notice how much real estate you have. And uh, at the end of the day here, what you're able to do is uh, uh, create, as I said before, essentially a custom dashboard for each of your file types. And the reason that we say a custom dashboard is there's now an, actually a preference here where you can go and say whenever you open up a file, automatically open up your custom page. So that that will bring up the first custom page in the list. And uh, that's just a preference here under the display for files. You can choose what you actually want to view. So that is uh, fantastic. We're not going to spend any time showing you how to uh, create them. Just very quickly, uh, I'll just show you a preview of that. But as an administrator, you can go in and go into custom pages and records, go to files, and we were in uh, family law in that case. And if you were to bring up the family dashboard, 
and we choose to edit that, you'll notice that in the designer itself, let's just go full screen here, I've got the ability here's ability to create custom fields. I can also now choose to drag in list views, and then I can also bring in a core field. So this again could be the main note or the file summary or what to do when the lawyer is out of the office or what the referral source is. So it's really uh, takes, takes the file customization to a whole new level and you have so much control over the layout of your uh, pages. So uh, with that, a quick review of the, uh, the new custom page layouts within um, Meeks Attorney 20.4. Okay, so the next uh, new feature there is tracking changes to time entry. Uh, basically, what you would want to do is if there's any significant changes on the time entry, such as uh, the timekeeper, um, a billing rate change, uh, any sort of duration change on the timekeeper, uh, someone, the responsible lawyer, might want to know, well, why there are changes to these time entries. Uh, previously, when you change the time entry uh, from the UI, you can you, you basically can open the, the current um, iteration of the time entry and you don't know if it was changed over time. So uh, we allow uh, users now to indicate whether they want to track the time entry through the firm setting. And once that is turned on, they can then create a certain type of description or, or reason uh, for the time entry change uh, on a list. And when a user go in to make that time entry change, uh, they will be prompted once that is turned on to make a selection from the list why the time entry was changed. That information is then displayed on the time entry when then subsequently you open the time entry and also on the report if you run the report to include corrected entry. Uh, sort of related to, to time entry, we also enhance the security profile uh, to allow um, certain uh, users, specifically responsible lawyer, uh, whenever they're uh, viewing or reviewing a, a file, especially in the draft format, that they can edit that time entry and make changes also to the time entry. Previously, they have to have a specific uh, security right, uh, billing administrator right. Uh, right now, uh, they can be a billing user and we can just turn on that feature. Uh, it will allow them to make those edits. And this, awesome. Yeah, and then just a couple of quick things related to calendar and tasks. And that is now we have some new settings such that if you use the uh, calendar or task profiles, that we can actually remember those settings between sessions if you log out and log back in. We've also improved the date calculator so that it can uh, stay open, and I'll show you that. And then we've also added some what we're calling smart controls, and that's for if you're looking at people on file and also referral source. So. Uh, we'll jump in and actually explain that in some detail here. So uh, to demo the, um, the time tracking feature, um, you have to be a billing, sorry, you have to be an administrator, not necessarily a billing administrator, but an administrator uh, to turn that feature on. And we have uh, track changes here. And that would allow you to uh, indicate whether you want uh, your timekeepers, whenever they make those changes, to be prompted uh, to identify why the change was made. So we have a checkbox for that, and we also allow you to add uh, to the list. So we will ship with just the first one on the list here, but you can add as much as you want on that list. Um, I'll just edit one uh, to show you, or I could do a new here. So on you, you, you basically click on new, you type in your description here, and of course, if you're typing in a new description, you wouldn't set it as inactive. Um, but if you have an existing one and you're no longer going to use that, you can then edit that. Um, that's the basic one. You can then edit it and uh, it allow you to set it as inactive. Now, why would you want to set it as inactive? Well, if you have used that time uh, reason code previously, we don't want it to uh, become obsolete. We want to still have it embedded in the database so that later on you can go and, and, and look at uh, a change time entry with that code and it will make sense. Uh, however, you may not want to use that code going forward uh, um, because it become obsolete, and uh, you don't want it to be. You don't want the system to keep displaying that code uh, because then the, the, the list would be very large. So it will only display for the user to make a selection from an active list. 
Uh, you can also, um, when you have uh, a lot of uh, reason code, you might want to move the one that you mo use most often to the top. So we allow you to um, adjust uh, the um, order in which you, you want it to be displayed. Okay. So that's setting up their time entry. And of course, um, it's uh, only related to posted time entry. Uh, bell time entry, you should not be able to change any uh, core field on, the, uh, on those time entries. And if it's unposted, you want a user to continue to uh, make changes until uh, they verify that they want to then save that time entry. Um, or sorry, post that time entry to create a, a work in progress. Uh, but once it's posted, then um, when you make changes, uh, at the time that you make the changes, it will prompt you to, to um, enter that code. So let me just demonstrate that for a moment here. I have a time entry on one of these files that was entered last year. Uh, it's still on build, but it's posted. It's in WIP. And I'll just bring that up. And I'll change, uh, let's say, the billing rate. I want to change the billing rate to premium. So I change it to premium here. and then. When I click on OK, it'll prompt me to enter that uh, reason code. Now, the system, you notice, will not default on reason code. It forces the user to select the reason code. So even if you click on OK, it won't save that time entry until you select an appropriate or a valid reason code. So I'll just say um, incorrect billing rate. And when I click on OK, it'll then save that time entry with that uh, new reason for the change. So if I reopen that time entry, you'll notice at the bottom there, it says change reason, and it indicates there it's an incorrect billing rate. That's why it was changed. It was last modified. I'll have the last modified date. Now, you may have several changes to the time entry. Later on, you might want to go and change the duration or whatever. Uh, whenever you open the time entry on this, um, in the file, you'll always uh, see the latest change that was made. However, we still keep track of uh, the audit. We still audit and keep track of all the changes that was made on that time entry. And that is display when you uh, run the report. So let me just cancel out of there and go to the report here. And it's uh, the time and fees journal report. Uh, here we have time and fees journal. And I'll just run that report, and I can't remember which file it is, so let's go back to the file rather than Carta versus Plant Portal. I'll just run it on that one file rather than display a lot of information here. Um, so it's Carta. Right, we got it there. And so on here, nor the, the um, default setting on, on this particular report, when you select from the report parameter is not include corrected entries. Um, if you include corrected entry, which I'll do now to show that reason code, and click OK, you'll see, I'll just expand that so that you can see it better. So on here we have uh, the change that we make. This is the original entry. It's We make a change that's been corrected. It said incorrect billing rate, and this is the updated uh, time entry for it. The second entry below that, you'll notice is the updated time entry for that. So what we are doing is if we go back and change this time entry, we'll then enter the next reason code that the, the user selects so that you'll have a chain of reason on that particular um, time entry. So you can track it. Okay. And um, with that, I'll turn it over to Andy. Awesome. Thanks, Mo. Yeah, I've just got a couple of quick ones that I wanted to uh, demonstrate, and that is around the uh, calendar, for instance. So we'll just go back over to the uh, front office here, and under calendar and tasks, actually the same uh, thing, is that if you presently use, you have both, when you're in a calendar, you have sort of a radio button at the top for either your work group selector or using uh, custom calendar profiles. And uh, this is just a simple change, and that is that, for instance, if you're accustomed to using the calendar profiles, you use them all the time, perhaps you have a very uh, you've set up a particular default, uh, we're actually now able to remember your last uh, selection, so whether you were in the calendar profile or work group selection, so that when you close and come back tomorrow morning uh, and you uh, get into uh, into Amicus Attorney, it will remember that previous uh, session as well. So that's true if you're in using the calendar profile or in your uh, task module, 
if you go and use the uh, task module, uh, again, the same thing, you've got your uh, custom calendar profile, custom task uh, profiles, excuse me. Now we can remember those uh, two settings. Uh, now, another nice improvement we've made is uh, just with respect to the date calculator. And this is a pretty straightforward one. Let's go back to uh, just our debut, for instance. And we wanted to quickly go and do a calculation for the uh, use the date calculator. And, uh, well, really simple example. Let's just actually sort of minimize it down a little bit here. And uh, uh, if we were to bring the date, I'll bring this back up here. The date calculator. Uh, you can actually keep that running on your screen, for instance, to say, you know what I want to do? I want to find out how many 55 business days after today is. I calculate that and then jump to that day, so it'll take us to the day. Whereas in the past, the date calculator itself would be closed. You can now keep that running for uh, as long as you want. If you needed to, once you've seen this date, jump to another one. So again, just a nice little workflow improvement to make life a little bit easier to, uh, to get around. Now, another section I want to talk about is uh, what we're calling smart controls within your files. And this is something that if you go back to that uh, example we were in before, Cooperman v. Cooperman, that you've got the people on the file and the role that they play. And then in some cases, based on the role that they are playing, there are additional settings. So for instance, that uh, we've chosen that Matthew is the lawyer and he's representing Tanya. So these are new smart controls we've actually added so that you can uh, just quick type and find that. Uh, it also means that if Tanya's uh, uh, name actually changes, that if you're merging, using this field to merge into uh, document templates, that it's updated accordingly as well. But it also means you can just click the selector, uh, say none, for instance, and then it goes back to a field that you can just type in to go and find uh, an option. So again, it's just much faster and easier to manage. And that's both for when you're dealing with lawyers, but also if you've got that reciprocal relationship where you've got the role is party, and you choose that they are represented by a lawyer, you've got a smart control now for making that association to uh, to who's the lawyer itself. And then another place, we've also gone and done the same thing, and that is under referral source. So if you're actually on the file and you go right now to admin accounting, you can choose matter came to us because, if we were to choose referred by, that too we've turned that into a smart control where you can go and uh, easily go and make that association. So again, some nice workflow improvements, just uh, more uh, streamlined in terms of uh, how you can go and quickly enter information into the system. Okay, before you uh, think there, I skip one uh, one aspect of the bill in there, uh, apologize for that, that I intend to show. And that was uh, set in the bill and security um, to allow a responsible lawyer to make edit. So as you know, um, we have uh, access to a uh, security profile for billing uh, an attorney. So we have one for billing, one for attorney. And for the one uh, where you would like to turn on access by responsible lawyer uh, to make edits, it's in the billing uh, selection there for action item. And it's the last item there that edit time entries on draft bill. And you can just edit here, turn that on, of course, you'll select the appropriate billing profile that you want, uh, and you then turn that on and you save it. And that means any user with this billing user profile will be able, and the, res the responsible lawyer will be able to edit time entry uh, that was entered by any other firm members. Thanks, Sydney. Yeah, perfect. Okay, so we'll just quickly uh, jump out and go back to uh, the PowerPoint for a second and, and take a look at a couple more areas. So. Some other improvements we've made are related to the client portal. And this is uh, great if you're using it uh, the, uh, to share information with your clients. Now, if you're sharing out custom fields, you can mark fields as both, uh, well, now you can choose to share them, mark them read-only, or mark them editable. So in the past, if you shared it, then the users could make changes, perhaps. So really a nice improvement here. We've also gone and added some self-serve options, and that is clients can now go in and reset their own passwords within the portal. And uh, this means that they don't have to actually contact you, and you don't have to go and resend them a new invitation. They can simply go to the login page and do it uh, themselves. And then the uh, other one is a great one, and that is that clients can now opt in or out of email notifications. So if you as the lawyer are actually sharing items in the client portal, that uh, clients can actually opt in to receive those, so basically to receive an email notification, letting them know that the lawyer has changed something in the portal. It's still up to them to go log in and see the details of that change, 
but it's a great way to uh, to make sure they're not missing out on uh, on things that are being added by the lawyer. And then, of course, within Amicus Anywhere, we've also made some minor changes, but uh, but big at the same time. And that is the calendar not only has the day view, but now also includes a week and month view. So let's very quickly just jump into the uh, demo here, and we can show you what uh, what we're talking about. So we're going to go back to the attorney side once more and just quickly open up that Cooperman Cooperman Matter. And we'll just take it off full screen here so we don't uh, I was vague. If we go to the custom pages, that you'll notice I have little icons on here. So there's a blue icon mean it's actually uh, uh, shared or editable in the client portal and a gray one which actually shows that it's uh, uh, not editable, for instance. And I can just click the icon up here at the top and choose the sharing option. So now you'll see that for each of the items that are uh, on my uh, uh, setup to be visible in the client portal, I can say that it's not visible in portal, to the portal, uh, editable in portal, or read only in portal. And that is just a, just a lot more granularity. So that means that you can ask a client to go fill in details in the portal. Once they've provided that information to you, you can mark that as read only so they can make further edits to it without you being aware of the change. So very quickly, let's just go into the uh, portal side and see what we're uh, what this is all about as well. So let's just minimize that and go back over to uh, the client portal. So the first thing to notice uh, on the client portal page, and this is as now clients logging in, they have the ability to click a forgot password uh, section here. They can go and put in the email address they use to log in. And as long as that's actually a recognized email address, we will send them instructions where they can go and reset that uh, uh, their password for it. But let's actually just quickly go log in and take a look at the, uh, the changes that we've actually made on the portal side too. So in this case, we've actually logged in as uh, our client called KV, and we'll just say not now to that, that you'll notice a couple of uh, minor changes right up at the top, you now have an option. So the client actually can click options, this is where they can see, while well, it's showing the name, they're actually associated with their email address. And this is where they can opt in or out of notifications. And the idea is, as the law firm is sharing uh, any records, whether that's the files themselves or documents, notes, appointments, tasks, uh, and invoices on those uh, files that they would be notified of the changes. So uh, a great great tool for uh, for making sure they're, they're kept up to date on the uh, uh, on any changes that are going on. And then let's quickly just look at a uh, file, for instance, and you can see the custom pages. So if we go to that Cooperman matter, uh, when it opens up, so it's called more, the custom pages are called more when visited by a uh, client. And you can see that, for instance, the respondent income is marked as read only, whereas the petitioner's income is still editable. And again, this is up to the, uh, the law firm can choose for any given matter which fields are going to be uh, editable or read-only for uh, for their users. <coughs> okay, so let's uh, quickly look at the, um, we just saw the client portal. Now let's jump into Amicus Anywhere. So we've actually logged in now as a lawyer to the browser component of Amicus Attorney called Amicus Anywhere. And if you were to go to the calendar option at the top, we're logged in as Terry here today. Uh, I can see now that in addition to the normal uh, day view, I've now added, or we've added a week and month view to the calendar. So it uh, just gives you much more flexibility when you're logging in uh, via browser to see more details about your calendar. Of course, you can go to a file and see lists of any, anything that's going on uh, for any of your events, but the idea here is just more uh, control to see the details uh, about your events. So with that, we'll turn it back over to Simo. Uh, okay. So um, the next thing I would like to show is uh, regarding the APX. Um, there's one one feature there, uh, reversible payment. Now this is not a feature that the user will see, so it will be very difficult to demonstrate. However, it's a built-in feature with the void and refund payment. Now the reason for this feature is if uh, you have a payment that uh, clear APX, however, on the back end, the bank refused to honor that payment, uh, either because uh, maybe the router number was incorrect, etc. Uh, then what will happen is that that payment will be rejected uh, back onto the system, and you wouldn't be able to uh, do a void or refund. When you do a void or refund, it'll come back and return, or previously it will return uh, sort of an error that you cannot uh, void or refund because it was never completed through the entire process. 
Uh, now the system is smart enough now to check the status of that payment, and if it uh, if it, you cannot void or refund it, it'll give you the option to do a reversal of that payment. And what that means is that the payment did not go through the full life cycle to clear the bank, so we don't need to hit the bank again to double charge the bank or, or double process that. The system will then recognize that and just update your database to reflect that there was a reversal. It did not clear the bank. So that's a difficult one for me to, to really demonstrate because it has to go through that sort of process. Uh, however, the other one I can demonstrate, which is uh, showing, uh, listing, uh, showing a listing of all the payment methods. Basically, when you enter payment method into the system, what we do is capture the last uh, four digits and, and keep that along with what we call a token because that uh, payment method is securely stored elsewhere. We don't save it in, a, in your database here. It's a reference more or less uh, to a secure site. And um, we can you know, list those payment methods and that's the way you can reuse those payment methods. You don't have to, each time you wanna make a payment, you don't have to re-enter those information. So we provide a report that uh, you can now look and see which client have a payment method. Uh, also, um, we allow uh, users to reprint bill uh, currently, you can do that, but it's a uh, time-consuming task. You have to go to each individual file, open the image, and then uh, click on print. Uh, this method here would allow you to select um, a bunch of invoices that you want to reprint, and then you can click on, uh, on the print button, and it'll allow you to go through and reprint those bills. Um, we also have a feature here that would allow you to apply tax on activity code. And um, some firms in, um, in Texas had requested this. Um, what it is is that you can tell the system whether you want to tax uh, on your activity code, which means that the system will look at the activity code and see if it's taxable or not. So you can uh, designate which activity code are taxable or not. Or if you're, tax, if you're applying tax on fees uh, without using the activity code, that means the system will assume all fee entry is taxable. Um, we had uh, expanded the UTBMS code. This is for your e-billing. Uh, they had added some additional uh, UTBMS activity code to the list. Uh, it, it's expanded, I think, to about 25 selection now from uh, originally 12 selection. And the referral report. That report, uh, I'll show you what it looked like. Basically, within Amicus, each file you can identify if uh, there is a reverse uh, Referral source, sorry. <laughs> and uh, with that, you can now run a report and it will give you billing activity information, uh, such as the amount of time entry you posted, the time entry that was billed, and any uh, payment that was done on those time entry um, within that uh, time frame. Let me just uh, go to Amicus now. And sorry, that long. Where are we? There we are. Okay, so um, to show you where you can uh, access the, sorry, to show you where you can access the uh, report for uh, your payment method, I'll go into the firm report here. And I'm on the attorney side, firm report, and I can go into uh, the people module, and we have here an option here that will give you the payment uh, method list. So I can run that, I can select it for one client, uh, or I can filter it also if I would like to include the expire payment method. And this is used quite often to determine if someone's payment method is uh, close to expiration. So I'll just run that on the screen here, and uh, basically let me just open that. Uh, what we have here, I'll make it a little um, page format here, and uh, just expand that so that you can see it maybe 150. Okay, so here we have a list of our client name, and remember these are contact. It lists uh, the payment type, the payment method type, Visa, MasterCard, etc. Uh, the account number, and that's the last four digits of the account number, along with the account name, and it lists the expiration date of uh, that payment method. So it's a centralized uh, location where you can go and review the payment method. Uh, maybe one of them is coming up. Um, uh, the expiration is coming up soon, and you may want to reach out to the client uh, to, to get that updated. 
So let's uh, just go with that. Okay, so that's the payment method. And the other thing is um, a reprinted bill. So reprinted bill is done in the same location where we send out payment requests. So we're in the billing module here, right? We have a couple of bills here. And I'll just do it for this couple of bills. Um, and we want to send out a payment request. Um, basically, uh, sorry, not a payment request. We want to reprint the bill for some, whatever reason. Uh, the bill was um, misplaced or something like that. Or maybe during the billing process, for whatever reason, uh, we can get a hard copy of the bill. So we'll uh, just select these bills that we want to reprint. and. Similar to the um, payment request, we have filters here. We use, we, we use the same uh, feature that we had before, which is uh, the, the billing module, which allow you to do all your, your filtering. And we just uh, click on the print icon here to reprint the bill. Now we have the same option as when we are creating our bill, uh, where you, whether you want to print the screen uh, or, or your printer. And we can do that print the screen here. Of course, uh, when you're reprinting the bill, most likely you want to reprint the bill um, to the printer because you want to, to send out that uh, bill to the client. Uh, and I'm just going to put it in a proper format here so that we can see it appropriately. And I'll just uh, zoom in there. So here is your, your bill that you reprinted. It's, uh, it's the exact copy of the bill that was sent out previously. It has all the details on the bill here. Um, you know. It's just an exact image, basically, right? And in this case, I have two bills, so I have the first bill. This is one of one, and I can just do uh, one of two, right? And I can just go to the second bill here, right? So we have two bills there um, that we can uh, view, uh, and we can also uh, print it if we have to print all. Okay. Um, applying tax uh, that is uh, set up uh, within your your tax system here. Um, the number for me use tax, and it's a tax set in here. Uh, it allows you to basically indicate whether uh, your new files are taxable or not by default. And then we have an option here that says use activity code set in for tax on fee. And basically, when you turn that on, uh, any new time entry, any time entry that you use an activity code, if the activity code is set as taxable, it will then pick up that information. Uh, and it'll sorry pick up that um, it'll perform the tax on that particular time entry that uses that activity code. So any activity code that doesn't have that are not taxable, it'll, it'll ignore the tax on that. If you don't turn that on, that means taxes on all time entries. And the um, expanded the uh, activity code. So if you go into your activity code here for um, task-based billing for your activity here. We have um, expanded that. I think it was up to 11 here. And now we expanded it to 28. So we have a lot more activity code there for your UTPMS code. And uh, the referral report, the referral report can be found in your um, Attorney side, and I put it in the business plan, and because basically we'll be using that as a management tool. So under office firm report, you go to your business plan, and we have a referral report. Now, before I go into the referral report, I just want to show you on the file where you set that up. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with that, uh, but what I'm referring to is the referral under the admin. Um, you have a referral under account in here. On your right hand side, there you can see you can who referred the file. You can indicate there whether it's a cold call, an existing client, etc. And you can add to that list. Um, sorry, you can um, add uh, a contact. Uh, if you do refer by, you add a contact. Um, because you, you you might not get a referral through that list that we provide, so let's uh, let's go and run that referral report. We go to the, the firm report here, as I said, business planning, and I select the report there. Click and run, and I'm just going to run it for this uh, year. 
So just so that you know, that referral report, um, the uh, period that we run it is based on the open date for that those files. So if we uh, if we run the report here and we click on OK and I'll run it for all file types, uh, we basically get a report here uh, that gives us the activity along with a summary at the bottom here of um, a summary of uh, what was um, posted for time entry or fee, what was billed, and what was paid. Now, if the firm do not have billing activated, of course, the paid column would be uh, blank. Uh, but at least they can use what was posted and what was billed so that they, sorry, what was posted only. They wouldn't have what was billed and what was paid because we don't know if it was, was billed or not. So it will be only what was posted. So you can see the, the firm can determine what sort of activity is going on through their referral source. And at the bottom here, we have, of course, the um, the summary of it uh, on the referral source. So we have the summary of what's going on. Uh, so we can look at the detail or we can look at the summary. Okay. And that's it for the referral. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Awesome. So we just got a couple more uh, things to touch on very quickly here. So I'm just going to pop out of here and back to the PowerPoint. And that is uh, just we've uh, we've introduced what we're calling the Customer Experience Improvement Program or CEIP, and that's just a way for you to help us. Uh, to help you, essentially. So you can opt in to share anonymized firm information about how you're using Amicus Attorney, uh, such that we can use that to further improve the product in the future. We've also now added a link to the Abacus Next account portal, so if you needed to uh, log a support ticket or update credit card information. We've also changed up the uh, document assembly link guide, or specifically the variables that are used for that. Uh, the QuickBooks, uh, we've actually done some serious work to improve the performance of QuickBooks specifically for subsequent synchronizations, so it's a big deal there. And we've also added some uh, mass change for uh, essentially file associations when you're working in Outlook itself. But uh, just quickly, I want to touch on just a couple of things in that, and uh, I think we can address almost all of that from uh, the Help Center itself, aside from this uh, Customer Experience Improvement Program. But you'll notice, uh, as an administrator under firm settings, uh, we've listed a Customer Experience Improvement uh, space here, and you'll be prompted to ask if you wish to participate. There's, uh, you don't have to, and you can certainly opt in or out at any time, but it just allows uh, you to share anonymized information uh, with us so that we can work to further improve the product uh, as well. And then within the uh, Help Center, that's just a couple areas I wanted to touch on. One, you've now got access to the Abacus Next account portal, so click that, and with your account details, you can uh, create support uh, tickets or update your invoice or update your credit card, for instance, for your uh, subscription. Uh, that's where you'll also find the merge variables uh, section. Uh, and then I guess a couple things to sort of wrap up with. One, uh, I'd like to, uh, well, I guess this is this is our wrapping up. So one, uh, thank you for, for spending the time here with us today. I think we went a bit longer than we had anticipated, but uh, there really is a lot in the 20.4. But I want to encourage you to uh, please sign up or continue to sign up for future webinars. Within the announcements page, you can see upcoming webinars. Uh, and then it's also a great opportunity for me to uh, to plug Abacus Maximus. And that is our user conference taking place uh, June 24th to 26th at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, where we actually have specific tracks for all of the products under the Abacus Next umbrella. But of course, one just dedicated to Amicus Attorney and uh, with hands-on training that you can uh, book out and actually uh, hang out one-on-one -on -one with a, a product trainer and uh, I do want to encourage you guys all to take a look at that and uh, and see what that's all about. And if you act now, there's also a discount for the early bird uh, pricing. But uh, I do want to thank everybody for taking part. Uh, it may be an opportunity for us to take a look at some quick questions. If there are any, again, please use that pane along the right-hand side, and you can choose to, uh, to add any questions. Yeah, I guess the first question is uh, our date. And at this point, we don't actually have a release date. Of course, if you're already using a version of Amix Attorney 20, then you'll actually be notified, or your administrator will be notified automatically when the update is available for download. There's also a firm setting that you can change to say automatically download those new updates. If you've not yet updated to Amix Attorney 20 and you're running on version 2016, for instance, I would encourage you to contact the support team and they can certainly arrange to get you up and running on the latest version. Uh, and we'll certainly keep you posted on the, the release date itself. Uh, some other questions here with respect to uh, date calculator that um, 
yeah, just a suggestion for improvement. And that's probably a good opportunity too to uh, plug the uh, feature upload section. Within Amicus Attorney, you can click on the suggestions option and uh, the, the ability there to go and put in a, a suggestion that you think others might appreciate. And, and then you can go and you and your uh, fellow Amicus Attorney users can vote on those. And that helps us to schedule future uh, updates as well. Yeah, the, so another question just about the Outlook Association. And that is now that you can select a number of uh, email messages in your Outlook view and actually change that file association uh, very easily just with a single click and, and make those changes. So uh, that's within the uh, Outlook itself as well from the add-in or the Outlook view. So some great improvements uh, there. We're just sort of running low on time to, to demonstrate. Okay. Qu quickly, I think there's one about the billing module uh, and time slip uh, compatibility. Once you activated the billing module, your only link would be with uh, with QuickBook. Basically, we, we link with QuickBook for the accounting part of it. All your billings will be within Amicus, so uh, you don't need to link with time slip to post any time entry. That Once you post a time entry, it, it treats it as a work in progress in Amicus billing, and when you create your bill, you create it within Amicus. Uh, what you're using your link for, which is QuickBook, is to maintain your accounting part of it, which is your, your firm activity, such as uh, pay and payroll or anything like that, uh, making payments. Yeah, and then, so another question of just, uh, are there other uh, fixes in the application? So once the 20.4 is released, uh, there will be a list of, uh, of other issues that were addressed within it. Uh, outside of just uh, feature changes as we've uh, documented here today. But uh, certainly I encourage you to take a look at that or certainly contact technical support and they can uh, uh, help with any questions about uh, uh, issues that you may have encountered in, in a previous version. But uh, I think with that, uh, we may uh, wrap it up. I do want to, again, on behalf of both Mo and myself, thank you again for taking, uh, a, well, actually we've managed to go a full hour here <laughs> out of your day to learn about uh, Amik's attorney. We will be recording, or we have recorded this, and so if you've got someone in the office who you think might benefit from this, uh, they can go to the webinars page on our site and uh, choose to watch this or any other previously recorded webinars to learn more about uh, Amik's attorney. Yeah. And we encourage you, if you have any questions, uh, to contact us and we'll be happy to um, yeah. provide an answer. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, I want to thank you again, and we will sign off. That's a lot to cover.